Inshallah, in this chapter, we shall talk about uh, chemistry of life. In other words, atoms, molecules, and uh, macromolecules that are important components of uh, living things. It may seem redundant and basic to you, but these are very important things, sometimes not appreciated uh, sufficiently. This is a cartoon picture or representation of an atom. This type of a cartoon picture is called a Rutherford model or Rutherford atom. In this picture, the nucleus is, of course, in the middle, and electrons are depicted um, orbiting uh, the nucleus in a circle. Electrons don't uh, orbit the nucleus as in, as in planetary model. They or uh, in, a, in a fine circular or elliptical path, they kind of go all over the place. But uh, this is a model. Since nobody has ever seen an atom, all our concept of how an atom must, uh, might look like are theoretical constructs, or in other words, how we think they would look like based on the knowledge that we have acquired studying their behavior. So this is a Rutherford model of an atom. As you probably know, the nucleus contains protons and neutrons, and the uh, electrons uh, orbit or fly around the nucleus um, thus. This is an example of a, a helium atom. Helium atom has two protons and two neutrons. As you probably also know, a proton has a positive charge, positive one charge, and an electron has a a negative charge. Now, what does it mean for a proton to have a positive charge and an electron to have a negative charge? Now, what that means is that protons are entities that are able to attract other things, kind of like magnets are able to attract other things. You can't see, so they have an inherent ability, force, so to speak, to be able to uh, attract other things, but they don't attract any other things they attract only th certain things and the things that they attract are called negative charges and the things uh, in the proton therefore are given positive charges and somebody could have labeled them differently but pro uh, those entities that uh, uh, attract negative things are called positive things by default so for an atom to ha for 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 a uh, for proton to have a positive charge it just means it, it attracts things that are negatively charged, just like magnets are able to attract uh, um, uh, other things. Now, what is this force of attraction? Really, we, talk, we talked about that there are only four types of forces in nature. There are really four types, and it's really not remarkably, there are only four types of forces in nature. Uh, first, everybody knows the gravitational force, okay, and then there's the electromagnetic force. And that's this electromagnetic force. So um, among the four forces that we know of in nature, the gravitational force, electromagnetic forces, okay, and then there are two, and then the strong and the weak nuclear forces. So these are four forces of nature. In other words, uh, things fall because of gravity, right? Protons are electro attracted to electrons because of the electromagnetic forces, right? So, and this, this is it. This, these are the four forces that, 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 that exist, okay? Now, the question is then, there, as I suggest, of the four forces, there is gravitational force, there's electromagnetic force. It is the electromagnetic force that allows a proton to, uh, uh, to attract an electron. Kind of like, you know, we use force in Star Wars to attract things, that kind of force. You can't see this force, just like you can't see like magnetic type force, right? But nevertheless, so those, that's the force. Now, what about the strong and weak nuclear force? What's up with that? I mean, if you think about it, if there are only four types of forces and two of them have the word nuclear in them, that means they're inside the nucleus. It's kind of remarkable, right? They must be something pretty important. You know, that's what I think. So... What's up with these strong and, and weak nuclear forces, right? Now, you agree that protons 
uh, attract electrons because they're opposite charge. You probably also heard that electrons repel each other. In other words, if there are two electrons, like one coming this way and one coming that way, you know, they're going to take a turn. You're not, they're going to be repelled by each other. So what's up with that? How come they repel each other, right? So, um, so uh, particles that have the same charge, they repel each other, right? So two electrons coming together, they repel each other, okay? But then, think about it for a second. You have all these protons in the nucleus over here. How come they don't repel each other? How come they don't move away from each other like, you know, they hate each other or something like that? They don't, right? How come they don't? They don't because of the strong nuclear forces put keep them in place. They hold them together. The strong and the weak nuclear forces are like the glue the, that keeps the, um, uh, the nucleus together. And neutrons participate in keeping the nucleus together. Because, you know, if how I mean, the, the protons, if, the, if there's one sitting over here, one sitting over here, they're going to repel each other, whereas a neutron is sitting in between them. Uh, that keeps this nucleus uh, more stable. So that's important to understand, I think, uh, because uh, electrons are attracted to protons and protons are attracted to electrons, but protons are repelled by other protons, but yet there they are, all huddled together in the nucleus. Okay, That's because of the other two great forces that uh, frequently don't, uh, we don't talk about. So there are four types of forces, gravitational force, electromagnetic force, strong and weak nuclear forces. It is the strong and the weak nuclear forces that keep uh, the nucleus together. And it is, and those are not to be messed with because they are very powerful in their own way. Okay, Because it takes a lot of energy to keep those two protons in the middle of the nucleus. In fact, that is the energy that is harnessed to make atomic bombs and things when you split nuclei or uh, combine nuclei. So there's a lot of energy stored in there. Now, in terms of, of the size, see, the mass of an electron is only one two thousandth of the mass of a proton. In other words, it would take approximately 2,000 electrons to make up the mass of a proton. So electrons are tiny little thingies, so very tiny little things. But yet, you know, in terms of the charge, they, they're equal charge. In other words, Protons' ability to electrons is like equivalent to electrons' ability to attract proton, so to speak. Yeah, they're like equally strong. They can lift the same weights at the bench, so to speak. So it's, it's it, they're tiny but powerful. So they're one two thousandth the size of the proton. Uh, 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 now the protons and neutrons are approximately the same uh, uh, mass. And the mass of the proton equals the mass of the neutron, approximately. They're essentially the same. Okay, so this is the basic structure of an um, of an atom. Now, one last thing before I move on from this is this this is not an accurate depiction of, of, of an atom. This is, of course, if you said this is a model. Models are meant to uh, to uh, give a conceptual representation, not a real actual. Compared to the to the electron, the space it floats in, the nucleus occupies like that much of space. In other words, 99% of the space here is actually empty. It's like playing ground for the electrons moving about, okay? So 99% of the, of the is, is space around the atom is actually empty. Uh, that's where the electron flies about, okay? And uh, electrons, as I said, they don't go in, a, in, a, in an orbit like in the planets do around, uh, around Earth, okay? They're kind of flying about all over the place. So 99% of an atom, in fact, is like empty space, okay? And the nucleus is a very tiny, dense part of, of, of the atom, right? Now, here are some basic uh, atoms. So a hydrogen atom is a proton with an electron whizzing by. Okay, now, now you might also say, why does the electron like go whizzing by? If they like each other so much, why doesn't you just just go in there like you know hug it and you know, each other and let's you know, be a happy couple or something like that? Well, that doesn't happen, okay? Because electrons, they're just they're quite amazing things. The electrons they whiz by, so they, they're extremely fast. Like they go around like you know millions of times, like in a second or something like that on the proton. So they don't go like this, they go like, okay, they want, so, so, let's say this electrons want to be, there's nothing but that electron wants more than just to be with the proton, okay, 
right? That's what it's like. It's it's like its life goal, right? So, but here's, it's just so fast. They come over here. They they, they overshoot. They they want to, but it's just so fast. It's like going towards the protons at a million miles per hour. Before they put the brakes on, it's all the way over here, and it goes turns around and out like this. So it's it's it, um uh, it's it's an, it's like that. So they're extremely fast. There's a lot of kinetic energy. They're moving about like like all over the place. Okay. So uh, that's why that's why it's it's like that. Now. So this is the hydrogen atom with one proton and uh, one electron. This is a helium atom over here. Helium atom has two protons, two neutrons, and one electron. Notice the hydrogen atom does not have a neutron. It commonly does not have a neutron. It can have a neutron, but it doesn't have to have a neutron. And it uh, usually doesn't. Okay. Now, so this is a helium that you see on the right side, okay, so two protons and two electrons, okay? So the number of protons in an atom equals the number of electrons in an atom, okay? The number of protons in an atom does not have to equal the number of neutrons in an atom, but protons and electrons are the same. So if an atom has two protons, it will have two electrons. If it has 37 protons, it will have 37 electrons. Now, what if an atom has more electrons, okay? Well, then they start filling in around orbits around the atom like this, okay? Now, what you notice over here is that the first orbit here around, around the atom can only hold two electrons, okay? Can only hold two electrons. See that one over there, okay? Now, if an atom, for example, this atom over here has three, this is a lithium atom, has three protons, it's going to have three electrons. So two of the electrons are going to, going to go in the first orbital, n equals one, the first orbital. And the third electron has to go in the second orbital, okay? Why so? Why can't they just go over here or something like that, no? The reason is because it's too cozy, okay? Because remember, electrons repel each other. So if there's a third one here, there's too much repelling over here for them to hang out in the same orbit like this, okay? So the or the first orbital, the one that's closest to the nucleus, okay, can only accommodate two electrons because any more electrons than that would start repelling each other. So the third electron goes in the second orbital like this. Now the second orbital, as you see, is much bigger than the first orbital. And in fact, it can accommodate up to eight electrons. It can potentially accommodate up to eight electrons. And the third orbital the same. It can hold up to eight electrons. Now here's one, two, three, four, five, six. This is carbon. Now carbon has six protons, therefore it has six electrons. And you will notice the first two here will go in the first orbital. The next four, four remaining electrons, will go in the second orbital, right? So carbon has six protons, therefore it will have six electrons, okay? So the first two electrons will go in the first orbital. The next four will go in the second orbital, okay? Now, now protons are attracted to electrons, electrons are attracted to protons. An atom desperately wants all of its orbitals to be free. It's like one of the things atoms wants. Okay, there's nothing carbon wants than have four more electrons to fill up the second orbital. It's like its life dream come true to fill up the one, because the orbital is more stable if it is full. Orbitals that are not full are not uh, 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 are not stable orbitals. Okay in terms of their electrical forces uh, uh, combination, I guess. So, an atom wants stability, okay? Protons wants to positive charges, want to be with electrons, okay, be stable, and the atom wants to, uh, to be, uh, uh, have full orbitals. So if this carbon had its way, it would somehow get four electrons to fill up its second orbital, okay? Okay, so, we talked about hydrogen having one electron, in, then a helium having two electrons, and that will fill its first orbital. Lithium, which has three electrons because it has three protons, will, will start filling the second orbital. 
Now, beryllium, which has four, it will start filling its uh, uh, second orbital. This is boron, and as we talked about, carbon, nitrogen, and then oxygen. Some of the atoms, of course, are, are of more interest to us than others. Carbon is, oxygen is, and hydrogen is because it's a component of organic molecules in air and water. And um, so oxygen has six electrons in its water orbit. So it would, its desires, its uh, dreams are to have, get two additional electrons somewhere, somehow, to fill up that so second orbital. Then it will be happy. So if you continue like this, so carbon, nitrogen, oxygen over here, and then fluorine. See, fluorine is interesting, like in, you know, fluorine is like in your toothpaste and stuff like that. Um, fluorine is over here. It has seven electrons. It really, really, really wants to have one more electron to fill its outer orbital. And then there's neon. See, neon is, is interesting because it has first orbital here with two electrons, and second orbital is full with um, eight electrons. So neon is like a happy gas, okay? Neon is a noble gas. That's what they're called noble because they don't react. The reason they don't react is because their orbitals are full. An atom that has a full orbital, okay, will not react. Uh, that is, an atom that has a, com a completely full orbital in its natural state, like neon. See, so neon is an inert gas, right? It's a inert gas. In other words, it's not going to cause many chemical reactions. Just like helium is. You know helium balloons, right? People people inhaling it. Kids inhale, they're, they're inhale helium and they sound funny, right? When it's like, you know, you know, they call it funny. Because it too has two uh, uh, first, first orbitals full and that's all it is. So its orbitals are full, therefore it's not, not going to react. So neon is a noble gas because its orbitals are full and it's a happy gas. So, uh, an argon is the same way. That's another noble gas because its, it's, its orbitals are also full, okay? So, an atom that has com completely full orbitals in its natural state will not react. Now, look at this over here. This tells you that there are 10 protons, therefore, that must have 10 electrons, right? So, two of them are going to go over here, and then the eight are going to go to fill the second orbital. Now, this is sodium. Sodium... Now, the second orbital is full, see? The second orbital is full. So the sodium, to put the next electron, it has to use a, a third orbital, okay? So it has to open up a new store, new orbital, so to speak, and put the third orbital. Now, as I just suggested, the atom's greatest wish is to have full orbitals, right? They want to have completely full orbital, correct? And I said, uh, for example, that carbon wishes to have like four additional electrons, right? And 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 uh, uh, fluorine desperately wants to have one more electron over here, and sodium is equal. Now look, fluorine is looking for one electron, right? Okay, fine. So it can go get this electron, and be happy. Look at sodium here. In its third orbital, it has one electron. For it to fill. This, this third orbital, it will have to get seven electrons. So fluorine is looking for one electron, and sodium is looking for seven electrons. Now, fluor, I don't know about you, but it's pretty intuitive to me, because it's going to be easier to find one electron than to find seven electrons. Who's going to give sodium seven electrons, right? So, so fluorine is going to have a hard time filling this orbital, okay? Fluorine is going to have easier time filling the orbital. On the other hand, if the sodium were to get rid of this electron, then it will have first orbital and the second orbital will be full. It will have one less orbitals, but at least its wish will be kind of come true because all the orbitals that are remaining that it has are full. So sodium is not going to be able to get seven electrons. Tough luck, dude. But it's, it will, it's going to be easy for it to get rid of that electron to cape to an atom that perhaps is looking for one electron, like fluorine, for example, that you find in your, in your toothpaste, so you fluorine. So it's magnesium. Now look, so hopefully you appreciate that. So orbitals, orbitals feel like this. Now this picture that I had before, okay, this shows you how orbitals feel. Two go in the first one, eight go in the second one, and then eight go in the third one, and then this one has three extra electrons on the outside. 
Now, one thing I just wanted to also share with you. I want to wait till it's uh, excuse me for one sec. So here's orbitals filling. Now, the electrons that are on the more outermost electrons, the ones that are all the way out here, on the uh, most outermost shell, there are called valence electrons. And this is a very important term that you must know. And the outermost shell is called the valence shell. Now the reason this is particularly important is because an electron may have like, you know, 37, an atom may have 37 electrons, but none of them are going to matter except for the ones that are on the outside because they are the only ones that participate in chemical reactions. So it was only the valence electrons that participate in chemical reactions. So who cares about all the inside electrons, see? Look at this one. This, this, this electron, this electron, this electron, this electron, they're part of a shell that's full. The atom's not going to mess with those. The only electron that's going to participate in, the, in chemical reactions for sodium, for example, is the valence electrons, the outermost ones. All the inside ones are not, not going to participate in chemical reactions. That's very important. Appreciate it. It is the, only the valence electrons that participate in chemical reactions. That we must appreciate. Now, that's just that electrons don't move in, like planet, uh, in planetary orbits. But what they do is they do one of these numbers. They kind of go like this or this, you know. They move about more like that. And the space that they occupy is called an electron cloud, see. So the electron cloud represents that the area or the region around the nucleus where an electron are likely to be found, right? So this, this is electron cloud for, for this particular atom. The, the electron is not going to be found over here for this atom because then it's going to be lost. I mean, How is it going to come back from all the way over there, right? So electron cloud is the region of, uh, of the nucleus where, where an electron is most likely to be found, okay? Electrons, as I said, they do more like this. They, they're, they're not like, you know, nice, neat orbits. So this, again, is the Rutherford model. This is a conceptual model that helps us understand how uh, uh, an atom uh, uh, looks like uh, and, be, uh, and helps us explain how it behaves in the simplistic uh, uh, cartoon-type drawing. Atoms really don't actually look like and I think you appreciate that. And as, as I also suggested previously, nucleus contains about 99% of the mass of an atom. And electron cloud contains most of the volume of an atom. Okay? In other words, most of the atom is empty space. 99.9% .9 of the mass is in the nucleus, whereas majority of the volume, 99% of volume is actually in a electron cloud. And since the electrons themselves are tiny, most of the electron cloud is empty at any given time. Now, these, there are different mo models to, to depict atoms, okay? So here's oxygen, which as I said is important to us, right? So oxygen uh, 16 here. Now, it has eight protons, okay, and therefore eight electrons, okay? An atom has the same number of protons and it has the same number of electrons. The number of neutrons may vary. So if you have an oxygen that has eight protons, okay, it may have uh, eight neutrons or nine neutrons, okay, but it, it's not going to have any less uh, uh, protons. When so, for example, if you have uh, let me go, okay. If you take a helium atom, okay, if you remove one of the electrons, okay, it is still a helium atom. It's a helium atom with one less electron. If you take a lithium atom and remove the electron, it's still a lithium atom, okay? It's a lithium atom with one less electron. But if you take a lithium atom and take away one of the protons, then it's not a lithium atom. It's going to be a helium atom because it's one less proton. So it is the proton that gives the atom its its uh, its peculiar characteristics, and uh, and its proton that makes what an atom is. So the number of electrons can change, and that does change during chemical reactions. The, and the number of neutrons can vary in nature. 
uh, and uh, number of protons for a given atom does not change. If you change the number of protons in atoms, it's not no, no longer the same atom. You have to give it a new name. So, so oxygen has eight protons, eight electrons. Two of the electrons go in the first orbital, six go in the second orbital. As we said, elect oxygen wants to get two more electrons so it can be happy and have completely full uh, uh, ele uh, uh, electron shells, okay? Now, as we've also said, the atoms, they don't look nice, ni they don't go like nice and neat, okay? The orbitals don't go like, like that. And they do some weird, fancy things, the way electrons. Why is it like that? It's because, it's purely because of how electrons, like, like you know, behave. Why, this electron, for example, it really wants to be as close to, close to proton as it can, so it's going to make its best effort try to get, make its way there. And if you try to get, and then going, if you, it's going to get, get repelled by various different things. So, uh, electron behavior depends on a lot of uh, electrical charges uh, uh, that attract it and and repel it. So the end of the, their orbitals end up being quite fascinating looking type things. Uh, for example, so here's these borons. Look at that. How cool is that? These are electron clouds. The probability clouds where you might find electrons. And that's because of the peculiar uh, interactions between these uh, subatomic particles. And that's pretty cool to me. Okay, so here's different types of electron clouds that, that inhabit. Now, this is not a chemistry course, but this is just going to give you an idea how uh, f a fancy electron uh, behavior in electron clouds can be. So, for simplistically, though, you, uh, 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 which ev uh, electrons are, are divided into how much energy they have, okay? And with that given energy, they can have different orbitals, and you can lump those orbitals in, and say, okay, approximately this nucleus, these all of these electrons here will occupy this space, and then the next bunch of uh, orbitals will occupy this space in, in a right? three-dimensional space, and the next bunch of electrons. So you group these orbitals together into shells, and that kind of gives us the, the Rutherford model type of thing. In other words, all the green electrons that you see over here will be inside this green spherical thing, but they won't be, there will be no funky shapes of, of, of orbitals that we demonstrate, but they can all lump all of those up into one big green spherical bowl, uh, so to speak, and then the yellow ones will occupy all those spaces with those various different uh, uh, orbital types. But this is simplistic representation of those various different or, or orbital shapes, and from there we get the Rutherford model. Okay, After, we're almost finished with the first part here, and after, after a brief, uh, uh, briefly I'll make a pause, okay? So here's hydrogen helium. Now helium has a full orbital, so it's a happy a happy atom because its, uh, it's the orbitals are full, it's a noble gas. Noble gases are, uh, are they're all gases, they their, their orbitals are full. And you start here, lithium, uh, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Again, we get to the neon, its orbitals are full. And argon, its orbitals are full. You know, at work, I, I use this to treat patients because it's an inert, uh, uh, inert gas, okay? So, um, uh, argon uh, is an inert gas, neon is an inert gas, helium is an inert gas. So, um, and this is a periodic table. Now the real periodic table is basically a a, a logical methodical uh, arrangement of all the known atoms of all the uh, atoms in in this matter. Okay, there's obviously rational behind this, and it's it's uh, uh, it's actually uh, quite amazing to the little I know about chemistry of how all this works. But uh, uh, a periodic table of elements of 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 atoms or different types of atoms. You understand that some of there are only 110 different types of atoms available to us, and some of these are only produced in in a, a synthetic laboratory environment, so they don't even exist in the real world. However, what you must understand is in the universe, there will be only 110 different types of atoms at most. Okay, in the world, this is these are all the atoms that you will ever find in the universe. So if you go to other other part of the galaxy or different galaxies. You won't find other atoms that are unknown to us. They will be like this. How do we know this? Because you can study distant stars from, from the light, the emit, etc. 
And it's amazing human human ingenuity is able to figure this out. But even after studying this, you can actually detect what kind of atoms are present in certain stars. So the number of atoms in the universe that, uh, that exist are right in front of you, right there. So periodic tables are arranged in atoms in orderly fashion. And they usually there's a key like this that tells you what each numbers mean because the numbers can be arranged in a different way. There are two things that you have to know about the basics of this. And this first is the atomic number. It's like a name, right? What's your number? It's a serial number, soldier. That's like this. Every soldier has a number. Every atom has a number. That's its atomic number, okay? It, equ it equals the number of protons that are in the atom number of protons. So the, this is aluminum atomic number is 13. That means it has 13 protons. Carbon's atomic number is 6. means it has 6 protons. This other number over here is atomic mass. Now this is basically the uh, protons plus neutrons uh, plus the little bit of electrons. That, that we said electrons don't contribute much to to the, uh, to the, the mass of an atom. So you can say simplistically that this is Protons plus, uh, or protons plus neutrons. So atoms' mass is basically the protons and neutrons, right? So if aluminum ha had equal number of equal number of uh, neutrons, it would be 13 protons plus 13 neutrons, and its mass would be like altogether 26, right? But it's written as 26.98. The reason is because in nature you might find uh, aluminum that has 13 neutrons, aluminum that might have thir uh, uh, 14 neutrons, okay? but on average of all the aluminum molecules, uh, aluminum atoms, if you take average all of them, the mass will be approximately this. In other words, more than likely aluminum will have 13 protons and 14 neutrons because this is closer to 27 than it is to 26, and most commonly in nature. Okay, That's what you can deduce from uh, from the atomic mass. This, of course, is a symbol or the name for uh, the uh, atom. Some of the symbols don't make any sense uh, uh, because they're from Latin, and like iron is Fe, for example. How does that make sense? But that's that's old names. So most periodic tables have a little uh, key or legend that you can use to uh, interpret. So this is carbon with the atomic number. This is it's like you know, the number of the atom that equals the number of protons, therefore the number of the electrons. This is the atomic mass, and that's the symbol. Okay, and they so they give you most of them give the name. But you, some periodic tables have a whole bunch of other stuff, and the legend will tell you uh, what that stands for. And really, I, I use what I uh, what I need, and I ignore what I don't understand. So that's the basics of the periodic table. Okay. Okay, this is the, the last slide in our, in our discussion presently. So, carbon has six protons, okay? And carbon, however, can have a variable number of neutrons, okay? Most commonly, it has six neutrons, but it may have seven neutrons and may have eight neutrons, okay? So there are three types of carbons. There's carbon with the regular 12 neutrons, there's carbon with 13 neutrons, and there's carbon with 14 neutrons. So a same atom with different number of neutrons is called an isotope. So carbon con uh, commonly has three isotopes, carbon with carbon, regular carbon is carbon-12, but so you don't call it carbon-12 because that's the normal carbon, uh, and then there's carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, and carbon-14 is radioactive, and used for radioactive dating, etc. So um, isotopes are atoms uh, 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 with uh, with different number of neutrons. Carbon thirteen, carbon fourteen is is a great example of isotopes. Inshallah, next time we we'll talk about uh, the different types of bonds that exist between atoms. Until then, as-salatu wassalamu alaykum.